the apostles prayed for 10 days. Have you thought about this? And then they preached for 10 minutes and 3,000 people were saved. Today, people pray for 10 minutes, preach for 10 days, and nobody's saved. Unfortunately, that's the state of affairs a lot of times in the modern church. But this was, this was obviously a, a message that was intended to reach a, a broad audience. It was intended to really be the, the initial explosion of the church in Jerusalem. Uh, up until this time, there were roughly 120 or so disciples. Uh, there weren't very many there in the upper room. But here after Peter's sermon, we're going to find out very quickly that there were thousands of people who came to Christ. In fact, we oftentimes think of the, the, the early church as something that was struggling and has a lot of trouble. But, you know, the early church in Jerusalem would be what we would probably classify today as a mega church. It had thousands of people who had become believers, many through Peter's first sermon and many through the witness of the apostles and the disciples uh, from that time on. But we're going to just talk about here's how it all got started. And I think it's interesting because when we think of the book of Acts, um, in fact, if you look at the oldest manuscripts, we might have in our book here the Acts of the Apostles. But the oldest manuscripts just simply say Acts. Um, sometimes it doesn't even have a title. And when we think about the acts that are occurring in the book of Acts, some of us might say, well, Acts is all about the Holy Spirit. It's all about how he came in the day of Pentecost and empowered the early church and was used as a witness to, to empower people to be his witness throughout the early church. And you would probably be right. Some would say, you know, this is, this is, the, this is the acts of the, the guys that actually were out there doing the work. This was Peter. Most of the first half of the book of Acts deals with Peter and his ministry. And then we move into Paul and his ministry. And these were like the two superheroes of the early church, right? They were, the, they were the, the idols of the church, if you were to put it in those terms. Uh, these guys were, um, you know, I, I can't think of any of us who aren't students of the Bible who would say, I wouldn't just love to go back and hear Peter's sermon in person. <laughs> I wouldn't, would just love to go and be able to pick the Apostle Paul's brain someday. Say, what, what were you thinking? What does this mean? What did you mean when you wrote this? I mean, these are sometimes the heroes of the faith that we talk about. And so well, oftentimes we think of the book of Acts as these are, this is, the, this is when the big league started happening with the, with the apostles and the disciples in the early church. But as Peter's about to point out, really it's not about any of those acts. It's about the acts of Jesus Christ himself that are the basis for what the whole church stands upon. It's the basis from which the Holy Spirit it was actually allowed to be uh, put out into the disciples' lives in the day of Pentecost. And it was the acts of Christ that ultimately enabled these early witnesses to be effective at communicating truth because the truth that they were communicating was life-changing. And that's the difference. And so we're going to look at that from this perspective. Note that this is Peter's first sermon after the Holy Spirit had come down on Pentecost. All of these people were all in Jerusalem. And all of the people that he, were, he was addressing at this point, at least as far as we've seen from Scripture, were Jewish people. They were the Jews. Uh, and this again brings us back to, again, uh, I keep bringing it back up. What's our outline for the book of Acts? It's found in Acts 1.8, right? Remember Jesus says in Acts 1.8, Ye shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in Judea. You see, the very first two places that Jesus mentioned they're going to be witnesses to are exactly being fulfilled right here in Peter's first ministry, his first message. This is who Peter is addressing in verse 14. Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said unto them, Ye men of Judea, and all ye that dwell at Jerusalem. Acts 1.8. He's fulfilling it. He says, Be this known unto you, and hearken to my words. And then he moves into the message itself. So I think it's interesting. We have to keep referring back to this was the... This was the format, this was the outline, and we're going to see it, uh, you know, get expounded upon throughout the book of Acts as we read through it. But there's three thoughts that, uh, that come out of this sermon this morning, that came out of Peter's sermon, 
that I want us to examine. And the first uh, begins here, uh, we'll, we'll jump down to verse uh, 17 or 16. They, remember, they, they saw this Holy Spirit. They saw these guys speaking in tongues. They didn't understand what it was all about. And uh, they, some of them said mockingly, oh, these guys are just drunk. But then he says what in verse 15? These are not drunken as ye suppose, seeing it's the third hour of the day. But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. And what does he say? It shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Peter begins by quoting the prophet Joel. And the first thing that he explains to these people is the outpouring here of the Holy Spirit is not just a fluke. It's not just us, you know, having some emotional high. We're not on drugs over here. He says, no, this is a fulfillment of prophecy that marks something very significant. And that is this, that the last days have begun. The last days have begun. That's what he's saying. It shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. What is the difference about the Holy Spirit from the day of Pentecost forward versus the Holy Spirit's action in days prior to this? Well, we know that the Holy Spirit was work, it worked through different people in the Old Testament, but they didn't have the Holy Spirit indwelling them for an indefinite period of time. There were times you will see the Holy Spirit would come on David. He would come on even uh, King Saul. You see other prophets and ones that would, would sometimes the Holy Spirit would come upon them. And then what would happen? The Holy Spirit would leave them. The Holy Spirit will now come to indwell and will not leave. He will be there throughout the rest of our lives. This is what Peter is explaining. Verses 17b and uh, end of 17, verse 18 it says, uh, and your sons and daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall dream dreams. And on my servants and on my handmaidens I will pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And so Peter continues, he says, and the start of these last days that are spoken of by the prophet Joel, the start of the era will be marked by signs. There will be signs to mark the fact that, hey, a new era has begun. There's a new time uh, upon the earth that's happening, and it's going to be marked by prophecy. Sons and daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. There shall be dreams. There shall be uh, visions and dreams, and he says they shall uh, prophesy. They, these are all be signs uh, of, the, of the new era that, that's begun. And uh, who was going to have these visions and dreams and prophecies? Well, it was those that were there in the very early church, the apostles, those that were there as part of the founders to identify themselves as legitimate, authorized um, people who were there to start the church, the ones that Jesus was working through. We know, uh, you know, you can argue about signs. A lot of times people today, well, we have prophecies today and this and that. And you know what? The, the fact is, even the, by the very later, after the first set of apostles had died out, even the very early church fathers all agree. They said the, the, all of these prophecies and visions and dreams, they died out. <laughs> After the, the, first, the first batch of apostles had, had died out, these things died out with them. These were sign gifts that were given to give these men authorization. They were to be the writers of Scripture. They were to be the founders of the church. They needed credibility. <laughs> Not just as uh, I'm a great speaker or I've got a great lesson to tell you. No, they had to have these signs to affirm that this was God working through them. And so this was, as the prophet Joel said, this was going to be a sign that the last days have begun. The Holy Spirit was now going to be upon all flesh, all who believe. And there were now going to be uh, these signs from the apostles and the disciples to identify them as God's people. Then we look at verse 19. He says, And I will show wonders in heaven above, and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before that great and notable day of the Lord come. Now, unfortunately, we tend to read as modern-day readers. And uh, we don't always get 
the passage understood because we, we read with our types of, of, of writing that we would write today. But as the prophet Joel wrote, as he's quoting here, and as many of the prophets of the Old Testament wrote, we see sometimes this, this part of the prophecy gets fulfilled, and then there's a time before the end of it gets fulfilled. And that's what's happening here with Peter. Peter's saying, uh, in quoting Joel, that the start of the era is marked by these prophecies, these visions and dreams, and the end of these last days is going to be marked by signs as well. Just as the beginning was marked, the end will be marked by these types of signs. Here's the signs that will come at the end. Wonders in heaven above, signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke, sun turned into darkness, the moon into blood. That hasn't happened yet. We haven't seen that on earth yet. And we do know that Revelation and some of the other passages in Scripture tell us these things are yet to come. So the end of this era, the end of this time, these last days, will be marked by not signs from the apostles and the disciples, but signs in heaven and the earth from God himself. These are signs that only God can produce. That's going to be the end of this period known as the last days. And I don't know if you've thought about this, what does that mean for us today? If we see the beginning of the last days began when Peter gets up at Pentecost and says, hey, the beginning started, we're prophesying, we're seeing dreams, the signs are here, and the signs are coming at the end of the last days when it's all going to be over, where does that put us? That means we are all living in the last days. This period of time known as the church age, sometimes we tend to use that as a more, uh, I don't know, appropriate term for us today. We live in the church age because we're all in church. But, uh, but the fact is, the last days, the last days are really the biblical term for what we are living in. Now, we tend to think, well, the last days means, well, well Christ could come at any moment. We got to be, you know, and it can all happen. Do you know what? That's true. <laughs> when we say church age, sometimes we forget that fact, don't we? Christ could come at any moment. The last days are where we are living today. And yes, I realize that good, solid Bible teachers for the last 2,000 years have been saying that. <laughs> but just as Peter says, you know, God is not slack concerning his promise. That day is coming. His promise is true. And if he says we're living in the last days, those signs are yet to come, and they could come at any time. What does that mean about our mission, and what we are doing here today. It means this is a limited time offer. <laughs> this is a limited time offer. I don't know if you've thought about it this way, but, you know, there's lots of infomercials and says, you know, you got to call now because this is a limited time offer, right? It's only three easy installments of 1999, but you have to call today. And you know what? They show the curse commercial the next day, and the next day, and the next day. I think, well, which day was I supposed to call before the offer runs out? I don't know. <laughs> we get a little, uh, I don't know, set aside by that. But, you know, it, it's, it's like this. It's like my, my kids have this game they, they found that goes back to my childhood, the game called Perfection. You ever see the game called Perfection? I don't know. I think that's just to give kids a nervous breakdown at a young, early age. But... <laughs> You know, if you know the game, there's like this uh, board, right? It's up like a plastic board, and you push it down. It was like spring-loaded, right? You pushed it down, it would click in place. Then you would turn this clicker timer, right? And you would hit go, okay? And you'd hear this, right? And it would just be like, uh-oh, what am I going to do? I'm going to die, you know? And you had to find all these little bricks and little pieces that came together and fit together in such a way that you'd fill all that whole board, and then you'd say, okay, hit the stop button. And if you could do it in quick enough time, then you were okay. <laughs> but if you didn't do it quick enough, whatever you got arranged and put on there, what happened? All the pieces went, kapsh, right, all over your face, and you have to start all over again. You know, it's like we're living in a game of perfection. <laughs> not that we are ever going to get to perfection. That's not what I'm saying. But we don't always hear it, but there's this timer. It's a limited time offer. The last days are upon us, and we never know 
when that little tray is going to pop up. We never know the moment exactly when Christ will come, when we will breathe our last breath, when we all will say our last goodbye. We don't know when that might happen. It could happen before we're done today. We don't live in that reality, though, do we? We don't live in the reality of the last days. This is what Peter is saying. This is a last day time period. There is a limited time offer. The Holy Spirit will now come to indwell upon all who believe. And he said, this will all happen in verse 20. At the end of verse 20, he says, this will happen before that great and notable day of the Lord come. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. You see what the offer is? It's an offer unlike any other. During this time, during this time of the last days, as we go out and share Christ, all who call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. The offer of salvation is open to everyone. That's why we have the little song, you know, red and yellow, black and white, they are precious in his sight. It's open. The gospel is wide open. When we celebrate communion, it's because Christ's blood paid for the sin of the whole world. He didn't just pay for the sins for the ones in this room. He died for and he loved all of those who aren't in this room today. And that's, that's a, I don't know. It's something that when you begin to think about, you realize... There's a whole lot more outside this room than are in it. And yet, the same offer, that limited time offer that we've maybe accepted in our own heart, how many people out there are going to die without knowing the offer that's found right here in Peter's message? All whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. This era that we live in, the church age, the last days, is marked by the power of the Holy Spirit. Again, as we've said before, that power, if we know Christ, is within us. It's marked by a time where we have a great message to share, a message of what Christ has done for us. He's completed the work. We don't have to think like the Old Testament where we're looking forward to a time where we hope Christ will die. We have to put our faith in a Christ that we yet to come. No, he did it. We just sang the song, I cherish the old rugged cross. It's a truth. It's a fact. Holy Spirit's upon us. Christ's message is clear and complete. And that there's a coming a day when all of this time will go away. It will come when the great day of the Lord come, when his judgment comes upon the earth. And during this period, this period is a special time. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. It's a limited time offer. And when Christ comes back, there will be no more time to turn to Him. Well, we got to keep moving. That's our first point, that the last days have begun. The second is this. Let's look at verse 22. He begins with these words then. He explains what happened to them, and then he explains to them what this is all about. He says, Ye men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs which God did by him in the midst of you, as ye yourselves also know. What is he about to explain to these people? That there is new life offered because of Christ's defeat of death. There is new life offered. You see, where does he start with? Here he is again, he's talking to the Jewish people. And he says to them in verse 22, essentially, you, you need to understand and you've all recognized basically that Jesus Christ clearly was from God, that he was used by God. He did so many things. He was a man, as Peter puts it, approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs. There wasn't a person in the audience there who couldn't say, yep, I, I've heard about Jesus. <laughs> I know what he did. He healed people, made the blind see, made the lame to walk. He did all kinds of things. And how does he do this on his own? Well, he couldn't have. They all recognized he couldn't have done it on his own power. It was through God's. He was clearly from God. And what does he say in verse 23? Him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, ye have taken. And by wicked hands 
have crucified and slain. He says not only that Jesus was clearly from God, he says you need to understand something. You crucified him. You're responsible for his crucifixion. And you know, unfortunately, many even theologians throughout the years have looked at this and looked at other verses and saw how the Jews, you know, we think of the words crucify him as he was there before Pilate. Uh, you know, we blame the Jews for the crucifixion of Christ. You notice how Peter puts this. He says, yes, you crucified him, but God knew it was going to happen. <laughs> he says, this was done by the determined foreknowledge of God. God ordained this to happen this way. Yes, you are responsible, but it was God's plan all along. God knew it would happen. But do you realize what he's saying, not just to the Jews, but to us today? Who crucified Christ? We did. Every one of us. We may not have been in the crowd that day yelling, crucify him. But it was for our sins, he was slain, right? The chastisement of our peace was upon him, right? That was something he had to take as the apostle, uh, as the prophet Isaiah told, tells us. It was us. It was every one of us that caused Christ to go to the cross. It was because of us he had to shed his blood. This is what ultimately Peter's saying. He's speaking to a group of Jews who probably many of them were literally there, but he's ultimately speaking to each one of us. We have to realize not only that Christ was from God, but that we're responsible for his crucifixion. We don't think enough about our sin today. When we speak of the gospel, oftentimes we say, well, wouldn't you like to go to heaven? Well, sure, who would not like to go to heaven? <laughs> you know? Well, Jesus loves you. Well, Sherry sure does. He does love you. You know what? But you know what? What did that love do for you? It did something you couldn't do for yourself. It paid for your sin. It sent him to the cross. It was his love for you that said, I'm going to take the sin of the world, the sin for each one of us through all the ages, and I'm going to bear it upon myself. I'm going to take that punishment. This is what Peter was saying. Uh, he had to be crucified for your sin. And then he says in verse 24, Whom God hath raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be holden of it. So what's the third part of the gospel that Peter explains here? Number one, Jesus was clearly from God. Jesus was clearly crucified because of us. And Jesus came back. He was resurrected. Because he is God. See, it's not just enough to believe that Jesus was from God. It's not just enough to say, yes, God used him in a mighty way. God, God did miracles through him. Do you realize that the apostles were going to do many of the same miracles and signs and wonders that Jesus was able to do? Peter and Paul could heal people when the Spirit would work through them. They were used by God. They were clearly being uh, authorized by God to do his work. But Jesus was more than that. Peter says the fact that he came back to life after being put to death shows something different about him than everybody else. He is God in the flesh. You see, the essence of the gospel is more than just believing Jesus was somebody special. It's about believing who he is as God incarnate. Emmanuel, God with us. We know he was from God, and we know he was crucified for our sin, and we know that he is God because he came back to life. And he confirmed David's prophecy in doing that. We don't have time to get into that this morning. But then what does he say? In verse 28, in speaking of David's prophecy, he says, Thou hast known to me the ways of life. Thou shalt make me full of joy with thy countenance. You see, in the end... When we put our faith in who Christ is, what he's done for us, just like the, the David, David, King David himself in the psalm, Jesus calls us to new life in him. Jesus calls us to that new life. You see, David had placed his faith in the Messiah who would yet to come. His faith in Jesus, even at that point in time, had given him a fullness of joy in his life and a hope of 
and a faith and an assurance of an eternal life to come. That's what he wants for us as well. New life is offered because of Christ's defeat of death. And the third thing, and we have to keep moving quickly this morning, but the third thing starts in verse 29. The third point is this. Jesus Christ not only tells us this, these are the beginning of the last days, and that new, new life is offered through him, but Jesus Christ is now Lord in heaven. He's now the Lord in heaven. Verse 29, he says, Men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David, that he's both dead and buried, and his sepulcher is with us unto this day. Why would Peter bring this up in the very first message that he preaches? Hey, I just want to remind you, King David's dead and buried. He's long gone. He's in the grave somewhere. Why is that so important? King David was the great king. He was the great founder of Israel, if you were was to look at it that way. He was the great psalmist. He was the great battle warrior. He was the man after God's own heart. He was revered. And you know what? The prophecies speak of the fact that David's throne will be forever. But David's in the grave. What happens to David's throne? Here were a lot of Jews who were worried about that, right? David shouldn't be able to be in the grave and be able to have his throne. The throne's gone. And even, of course, this time, was David's throne really set up? No. The throne was in Rome, and Caesar was sitting upon it. David was long gone. Peter reminds them of this. And he says, but he says in the end of verse uh, 30, he says, uh, he would, he says uh, that of the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne. You see, the prophecy says that David's throne, the kingdom of the earth, the earthly throne, will one day be occupied by Jesus Christ when he comes back to earth. Verse 31 tells us, He, seeing this before, spake of the resurrection of Christ. In other words, he recognized he was putting his faith in Christ. He realized that he needed that redemption from his sin, just like every one of us. And he realized that this Christ, this one that would come, would ultimately be the one to take the spot on his throne and have all the world subdued underneath him. This is the fulfillment of Christ. David prophesied that Christ would be resurrected. And here, the Peter says, the prophecy of David has now begun to be fulfilled. We have all these witnesses, he says. The apostles and disciples witnessed Christ's resurrection, and the Holy Ghost was a witness to the people through the apostles. In verse 34, he continues, he says, David is not ascended into heaven, into the heavens, but he saith himself, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand until I make thy foes thy footstool. Therefore... Let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. Peter says this, David might be the great king, but he acknowledged a Lord that was greater than him. The Lord Jesus Christ. And even though Christ has not set up his kingdom on earth yet, he is reigning from heaven. He sits at the right hand of God on his throne. And what is he doing right now? He is waiting until all of the enemies are to be put under his feet and the last days are coming to an end. When those days come, he will come and set up his kingdom on earth. That's coming at the end of these last days that Peter's talking about. And until that time, Jesus Christ, he says, sits on the throne in heaven until he says, I make thy foes thy footstool. What is Peter ultimately saying about Christ? He says, David made him Lord of his life. He says, he acknowledged him as both Lord and Christ. Christ is simply the word that we might see in the Old Testament of the Messiah, the anointed one, the one who would ultimately save us from our sins. But to be a Lord is something different. It's to be a king. It's to be a ruler. It's to be someone who has authority and has power that we, we obey. A Lord is really a master. 
In other words, Jesus wants to be not just our Christ, not just the one that we cling to for salvation, but he wants to be the Lord of our lives. He wants to be in control. He wants us to yield our hearts and our minds and our actions and our behaviors and our hopes and our dreams and our desires and our problems to him. He wants to be in charge. You know, the problem with a lot of the modern church today is this. We have a gospel we've watered down. We've turned it into, oh, just love the Lord, go to heaven, say a sinner's prayer, it's all okay. And then we've said, you know what, and you can keep going, just, you know, give a little of the church here and there, or watch something online every now and then, or read a good book every now and then about God. But you know what? You, you don't really have to just change everything in your life. You keep going on as you've been. And what do we have? We have exactly what we claim to be in America, a Christian nation. We're a Christian nation, sure, in the sense that we talk about Christ sometimes and we have this sense of generally we think people should be good and go to church and Jesus was a good guy. And I mean, oh, there's a lot of positive vibes when it comes to be a person of faith, right? But see, that's not the gospel that Peter talks about. Peter says, if you're going to understand the gospel, you're going to understand Jesus Christ, not just as Christ, as the one that you sent to the cross because of your sin, that you needed redemption from, that you get new life in him. He says, you also need to see him as your Lord. He wants to be just like he was for David, the same Lord and Christ of our life. We hope in him for salvation and we yield all of our heart to him. Our life is not our own anymore. The Bible says we are now bought with a price. Do we sometimes not act as if we're really Christ? Do we sometimes act as if we're still in control? Like, we're, we're our own person. We get to rule our own thing. Yeah, he gives us a stewardship. He wants us to make decisions. He wants us to use the resources we have. But do you know what? We have to submit those things back to him. He wants to be the Lord and the Christ of our life. The truth is, three things as we close. We are living in the last days. Has that sunk into us yet? What that means, the church age, I know, has gone for almost 2,000 years. But even today, this is a limited time offer. All who call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. That offer is coming to an end when the last days end. This is the time. Today is the day for salvation. We don't know when it's coming to an end. It's our job, just as it was the apostles, to make the most of the time that we've given to share this offer with all the whosoevers that are out there. Secondly is this. We have this offer of new life in Christ. It's still available for all who believe. Maybe you're here this morning and you're not sure. Do you know that it was your sin that sent him to the cross? Maybe you've never thought about that before. Maybe you... Never really put your trust in him. Put your faith in Jesus Christ in those terms. Recognizing he paid the penalty that you deserved. And now you can put your faith in him and get what you don't deserve. Because he loves you. That's the awesome message of the gospel. And finally, as Peter ends, he says, we have to realize Jesus is one day going to set his kingdom up on the earth. David's throne will one day be occupied. All nations shall bow to Christ. What do we do with our lives? Are we going to wait until that day to yield to him? Because we won't have a choice then. We will be part of the group that bows our head to him. We will acknowledge him as Lord. But he wants us to acknowledge him as Lord right now. What are we doing to acknowledge Christ as both Lord and Christ in our lives.